Welcome to Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books. I'm Mark Lamont Hill, the owner of Uncle Bobby's. Uh, and we are truly blessed um, this evening uh, to have yet another and an amazing series of author events this year. Um, and as we move toward the end of the year, we're fortunate to have uh, Heavy. This is, the name of, this is a very special book by uh, Kiesa Lehman, my favorite writer. And I and I don't I don't I don't throw compliments out there that I don't mean. He he really is my favorite writer. And I I was, I was getting dressed on the way here and I was like I, I shouldn't even wear no writer hoodie <laughs> talking to you, man. Because I don't feel like one after saying? I read his book. No, really, really, I don't write shit like two weeks after after I read his stuff. Because he, he's such a compelling writer, such an honest writer, such a such a such a beautiful spirit that comes through in the text. Um, and I'm so grateful that you came here to to share. So grateful you have me. Oh man, so let's jump right into it. Yeah. You want to write a lie? Yeah. What kind of book did you want to tell? What kind of, what were you thinking? What was your process? What were you thinking about this book? Uh, so the book I saw, the Scribner, was a, um, it was a weight loss book. I was gonna lose 150 pounds. <laughs> Everybody laughs, this motherfucker up here laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love telling the story, looking at the laughter. He white, can do it now. The, the, white, the, the white brother, like, <laughs> uh, that's what I saw. I was gonna, I was gonna lose 150 pounds, and um, I was gonna talk to my mother, my grandmother, my aunts about their relationship to food, violence, sexual violence, racial terror, and weight. And um, I started doing all the interviews with my grandmama, my mama, uh, auntie, and them. And at some point. I mean, it's just true. My grandmother was, was, was supposed to be telling me this story of, of, of what happened to my youngest aunt when they all went up to Milwaukee one summer, but they left my aunt um, in Mississippi, and that was the, the summer that she got sexually assaulted by a number of men, and when they came back, Sue had gained like 50 pounds, so I wanted her to talk about that. And instead of talking about that, my grandmother started talking about how like that summer my aunt worked in the chicken plant, and <laughs> if you work in the chicken plant, you got a discount on chickens. And my aunt used her discount on chickens to buy a lot of chickens, and she fried up a lot of chicken. And so it was just a complete and utter fantastic lie. But it was a good lie. And then I said, Grandmama, like, why are you lying? And then my grandma was like, well, Key, turn that shit off. And she's like, because you're going to put this in a book, you know? And so then I was like, okay. So I think the way my grandmama were playing with language was interesting, but really it was going to be a book where I sort of was like a tourist in my own family telling the nation about my grandmama, my mama, my auntie, and them like relationship to things that they didn't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And it really was going to be a book about words. And so instead of putting that shit out there, I was just like, all right, I need to write back to them after listening to them lie to me to my face um, vividly. I just needed to write to them. And then I wrote a chapter to my mom, wrote a chapter to my grandma, wrote a chapter to my imaginary daughter, wrote a chapter to my ex-partner, who I was very emotionally abusive to. And then the hardest chapter of all those chapters was the chapter to my mama. Because, you know, it was just us. She had me. She was very young, and I was just like, if I'm gonna do this book justice, I need to write to her, and 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 I need to not just write to my mom. I need to write to a black woman born in 1954 who grew up in the middle of Central Mississippi, who went to Jackson State University, who went to Wisconsin, who felt the calling to come back to Jackson State University, who was instrumental in all the progressive movements in my city and my region between '85 and I would say '98. So that's what I wanted to make the center of the book, because if I made that person the center of the book, I was going to be less likely to lie. So I wanted to tell a lie because literally Scribner paid me to tell a lie. Mm. And along the way, I was just like, fuck it. I got a job. I got tenure. Let me just go ahead and try to write the book. That <laughs> I, <did." laughs> I think that's important. I think that's important because I had I not had a job, had I not had tenure, I would have written that book that they wanted, they wanted written. And um, so that's what happened, you know? So I just decided I was going to write this book to my mama with my mama, with my grandmama, um, and just hope, and just hope that it could turn out like unlike any other memoir I'd ever seen. Yeah. And you know, it almost turned out. It's not. I didn't do it the way I really wanted to do it. But well, I don't know. You did it the death. I got close. I, I don't know what's left. I got, I got close. You you talk about this. So there's the the kind of industry push to tell a certain kind of lie, in the sense of telling a certain kind of story. Absolutely. But as you write through the text, there's also this way that you're uncovering layers yeah. of truth for yourself. Yeah. That, that the lies aren't just to the world, they're also to yourself. Oh, yeah. And that the family's telling to each other. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, well, first of all, thank y'all for having me here. I, oh, feel, yeah. I feel so special to be like next to you oh, cool. um, and just to be in this space. Uh, I was just talking to Imani, who, without Imani Perry, I'm not here. Like, literally, like, walking. I'm sorry, it's the truth. I'm not walking, and if I am walking, I'm not thinking. So I just want to be very, very happy to, to let y'all know I'm very happy and feel lucky to be here. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, this is not... I think what I want people to know most about this book is that it's not a precious book. I don't think the lies that I told myself or that I told my mom or my mama told me, I think the constitution of those lies is like very familiar. I think the shape of those lies might be different. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I had my mama had me, she was 19. I saw her and I had never seen her in a healthy relationship, actually a healthy romantic relationship. I've always seen, I've only seen her in abusive, physical, emotional relationships. And um, my mother also was just like in Jackson. She was always on TV. So one of the lies we told each other and we told the world were that like we were doing all right monetarily. You know what I'm saying? Because you know black folks see black folks on TV. Motherfuckers think we rich. You know, even if it's public access. <laughs> like, because we're so we 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 were so loving and desperate for wins. And so when you see a black woman talk, you know, doing political prognostication. And talking the truth about white people, like people just thought we were, we were good, and we weren't. You know what I'm saying? We weren't for a lot, lots of reasons. Um, you walk in the supermarket, bruh. Like that's the story. I mean, that that might be the most embarrassing story in that yeah. in that book from my mother, is that, you know. Early in the book, I talk about being at this house, <laughs> which to me was like the internet. You know, it was a house where it was the first time I saw porn. The first time I saw fucking like a dildo it was the first time I saw Mike Tyson fight. They had the best video games. Um, the two brothers would actually fight each other with trophies. You know, like so all the shit you weird shit you see on on the internet now. I saw at this house my mama used to drop me off at, and um, and that house also you know it was a colleague of hers who was older who had who had who had you know significant amount of money, and so you know. I would compare their pantry to our cabinets because we didn't have a pantry we had cabinets mm -hmm. and their refrigerator was filled with fucking like name brand shit and especially you know name brand blue cheese dressing which might not mean a lot to people name brand sandwich bread which might not mean much to people name brand miracle whip mm -hmm. which might not mean a lot to folks but like my mom and then we had she was like broke bougie right so we we didn't have shit in our fridge except shit like olives and like <laughs> old ass wheat bread you know or like you know maybe a slice of like pumping you know like things that whatever you know like that's that that was my refrigerator that was our refrigerator but end of the month you got to go to the store whether you have money or not and the story my mom to this day really did not want me to tell is that we were in the uh grocery store and she was trying to get this stuff to make some tuna casserole because that's what she made. That's like the thing that she made. And uh, when we pulled up, I remember I was reading Right On magazine. I don't know if y'all in here are old enough to remember Right On. And I was like, can I get this? And she was like, I'll get that magazine for you for your birthday or something. <laughs> and then I saw her face behind the cashiers with a, with a, with a, with a sign that said, do not accept Nan check from these people. That's what it said. And it was a picture of her and her license, and there was some other pictures of some other people. And then I was like, Mama, let's just go, let's just go, let's just go. And she was like, keep, keep be, be quiet. And then I think she saw it. I mean, at the time, I thought she saw it. Now I know that she saw it for sure. And we got in the car. She started telling this speech to me about how, like, they never value our work. Um, she started talking about my grandma working in chicken plants and whatnot. And so, and she let me drive her home that night. And, like, by the time we got home, she'd fallen asleep in the passenger seat. And to me, that was one of the most intimate memories I have of my mama. But it's also a memory when collaborating with my mama for this, that she was like, "Key, I don't want you telling that story. You know, you want to tell the stories about my beating you? Okay. You want to tell the stories about gambling addiction? Okay. But I don't want you to tell the story about my body feeling a kind of shame that I still carry with me today. And um, so... The next to last draft, I took that whole chapter out, and then I talked to her about why I think I needed to be in there, and then she said, okay. But yeah, mm -hmm. so so it's just interesting to me, that, like in that book, there's a lot of things I think 
we, 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 we lie about and we're ashamed of, but that specifically is still the thing that she feels most ashamed of, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. Your, your, your sense of shame yeah. that you talk about throughout the book <clears throat> is often linked to your, your body. Right. Um, when did you first feel that moment where you said, the body that I'm in doesn't make me feel safe or free oh, or happy? Uh, huh. Um, I appreciate you asking me that. You asking me. That. I, would, I, I would not appreciate that coming from somebody who I did not love and respect. So, uh, so one of my mother's students um, had a sexual relationship. She was 21. I was nine. She had a sexual relationship with me for two years, and before that. Another person, in, another person in my family, um, another older woman had a sexual relationship with me for two years, and in both of those relationships, were, which were very different, the 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 woman who was my mom's student was was a, uh, I mean she was she was she was not tender, she was she was she was harsh, she was, she touched me harshly, but I still felt loved because she touched me harshly because I thought somebody who in my mind I was like damn she's so fine she could be touching anybody, mm-hmm. but she's touching me. The problem was. If, you know, the end of that quote unquote relationship. I thought she was my girlfriend. I heard her being sexually assaulted by her partner. Mm. And I remember thinking, looking at his body, you know, and I mean, this motherfucker literally had a body like Apollo Creed. I don't know if y'all know who Apollo Creed was, but at the time he was like, he and Mr. T were like the most ripped men mm. that I'd seen. And then, so I felt small, like, and I felt soft looking at that body. But I just assumed that like she didn't want to be with me because my body was soft. And the other person in my family who did some different things to me, I would hear this person sometimes in a relationship with her partner. And, and again, it, the assumption was like, oh, you're not choosing me because I'm a bigger boy. You know what I'm saying? I was nine. I was, I was, I was, I always wore the husky jeans. I don't even know if they still make the husky jeans for kids, but like I always rocked the husky stuff. I was big. And my assumption was that like, the women who wanted to touch me stopped touching me because I was too fat, too sweaty, too soft. Mm-hmm. Um, and similarly, like when my friends, who also got sexually assaulted that week that the book starts, when they got picked to be assaulted, I just, I remember sitting around thinking like, fuck, like, yeah, I'm glad they didn't do that to me, but I wondered did they not touch me because of my size, because of my wetness, because of my sweatiness, you know, not, you know, maybe they didn't because I was bigger. Maybe they didn't because I could fight back. I wasn't sure, bro. So, like, I don't know. I think if we all mind our memory, I think we can all mind our memory for places when our bodies felt like too much or not enough. And I think, luckily, um, lots of black women have written in extensively about, like, the layers and layers and layers <coughs> of perception and feeling that they had to deal with with their bodies. And I just haven't seen that enough in our literature. Um, I, I, I think Essex Hemphill, I think a lot of queer brothers have started, did start do a lot of that work too. Um, but I hadn't seen supposed cis straight man do that kind of work out of my region. Um, I think Etheridge Knight actually you could argue was sort of trying to do some of that stuff. Um, and so I just wanted to, again, if I wasn't gonna lie, I wanted to try to tell the truth to my mama first, give her a chance to talk to me about what I remember. And hopefully she could talk to me about what she remembers and then just trust that there'd be readers out there like you who would who would generously like give themselves to the book mm-hmm. and that's what i that's what i tried to do with this book mining memory yeah you talk about it now i don't want to spoil the book but there are various points in the book where you talk about the importance of memory and right. remembering right and how we remember right. both as a nation and as individuals yes. and as black folk yeah first at the level of writing how did you mine that memory in ways that produce new stuff, um, healthier, fuller, thicker kind of narratives of what really happened in your estimation? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that that mining process is never over, right? right? So um, <coughs> the best part about this book to me is that like it wouldn't have been written had my mother not instilled a writerly practice in me. My mom made me write hour and a half when I woke up, hour and a half before I went to bed. <laughs> I played lots of sports. She made me write days of games. If I came back home, she made me write. If I fucked up in school, she made me read and write. 
she also didn't let me read or write black shit, right? Which is weird because she was a black political scientist uh-huh. focusing on black political movements in Mississippi. <laughs> she made me read, especially when she wanted to discipline me, she made me read Faulkner, she made me read Eudora <laughs> <laughs> Welty, she made me read Silas Myrna, she made, made me read Tale of Two Cities, she made me read all this white shit that she thought was going to protect me um, from them. And at the time, I didn't appreciate that shit, I didn't like it. And um, but I would you know like again we didn't have cable so at my at my other friend's house they'd be sneaking to watch Skinamax Cinemax and like I would be having to sneak to read like you know Spunk uh, by Zora Neale Hurston or you know Harold Cruz shit like you know like so my mama's process of making me read and rewrite I think eventually led me to understanding that like I'm never gonna get as close as I need to to the memory or to the imagination unless I keep layering and that's why like I mean that's another reason I'm here like I'm a terrible writer but I think I'm a pretty good reviser you know what I'm saying like and this book went through about 16 17 18 revisions because you know my first my first the first things I write I'm usually thinking about white folk too much I'm thinking about you know how to correct them and all that kind of shit and Mm. stuff that actually makes a lot of people money um but but and, and and that's cool. I mean that stuff needs to be that stuff needs to be that stuff needs to be read, read written. But I don't think I need to only write that. And so for me, it's just like I just know I have to revisit. And that's the thing about love. I think love requires a particular kind of revisitation. I just have to revisit and revisit and revisit and revisit to layer and um, and just hope that the layering has some integrity. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And so and so with this book. I just think it's also important to say that like it's just important for me to let people know like even with the layering that I did I still I'm still wholly dishonest in that book about some major things um you know what the, the place that I grew up on was indigenous land before it was anybody's land and I talk about my grandmama tilling that land I talk about my mama having to work that land too I don't talk at all about indigeneity I don't talk at all about indigenous sovereignty not because I didn't think about it, but because I didn't know how to like put that shit into the text in a way that felt um, literally like cradling. You know, I could have put it in there, but it would have it would have just seemed like I was putting it in there. But in not putting it in there, I'm 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 lying. Like there's, there's a layer of me that like I just I just didn't know how to do that shit yet. You know, so I just think it's important for all of us who really want to be writers to know when we do well, know when we kind of hit it, but also know when sometimes a market driven like deadline sometimes dictates that we leave out entire not just ideas but people mm-hmm. and that shit matters you know mm-hmm. and so like for my next projects I'm hoping to not do that but for this project I definitely was <coughs> dishonest in some ways I, I, I wish that I was skilled enough to not be dishonest and I wish I had enough will to not be dishonest but I, I wasn't the white gaze <laughs> is Obviously, central. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Half this room did. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it's it's sort of central to what you're talking about because right. oftentimes the people who write those kind of books you're talking about are writing to white liberal audiences. Of course. To make them feel better about racism or white supremacy, etc. Right? But this is also way. That, there's also this way that the white gaze kind of haunts your relationship. Always. And with your mom in particular, and the yeah. threat of it. Yeah. Um, one of the things your mom was trying to do is protect your inside. Yeah. Well. Yeah, she says that. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, let's, let's go. Let's go somewhere with this. I don't want this to feel like therapy. I just want to. No. I just, but, but but what I'm fascinated by is is, is essentially the, the 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 kind of consistent narrative that I'm protecting you from what they will do to you. Right. I want to stop this thing from out there from happening to you if you do this thing. Right. And that becomes an, at least a pretext for, as your uh huhs are implying for some things that happened throughout the text. Yeah, I mean, I mean, bro, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and I spent most of my weekends in Forest, Mississippi. And so, I think my mama worked hard to love her, to love our people, to love me, love my insides. I think by 10 years old, I don't know that any of that shit my mama did to protect my insides from white people worked. Any of the disciplinary stuff. I think what did work is when she held my hand. I think what did work is when she like, fucking like let me feel her tears dropping on my face and she let my tears fall on her face and she said key um i'm sorry or key can you tell me why you did what you did i think those things protected my insides fucking me up with a patrick you and adidas in the face fucking me up with a clothes hanger which is one kind of abuse 
another kind of emotional abuse, psychological abuse that we may talk about or might not. I'm not sure that that shit protected my ins. I mean, actually, I know it did not protect no, my yeah. insides, you know. Um, but I understand why she thought it would. I understand why my grandmama and our grandmamas thought it would. I understand that notion of like, I'm going to do this to you because what happens, what the white folks going to do to you is going to be even worse, which is, I think, sort of true. But I just don't think that those things stop that shit from happening. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? When I was 12 years old, fucking police officers were telling me they saw me throw crack out of windows. You know what I mean? Like the day before and after I got whooped to protect myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would get beaten because my white teachers would fail me. And because I read so much, I understood. I'm like, damn, you beat my ass because my white teachers failed. So it's, it's mm. counterintuitive. It's like, how you protected me when they failed? They gonna fail tomorrow too. And then you gonna beat me again? That ain't, that's, that's mm. not, I don't feel like that's protection. But I say all that to say, when I have children, I know if I did, I'd make probably similar, similar decisions and I probably would fail similarly or maybe differently. But I think it's important for me to say to you and to my mom that a lot of that protection rhetoric I think harms our insides. And I'm not just talking about beating, because I think we focus on beating and we don't talk about the other ways we can all be abusive. Um, so no, I don't think that that shit like protected my insides at all. It made me confuse intimacy with Tara in a way that I, that I think the nation already wants me to confuse intimacy with Tara, so. Wow. There's a way that the world keeps telling you, you're fine. Yeah. At least in your intimate relationships. Right. The people who loved you, loved you. Yeah, 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 for sure. And you kept hearing, it seemed like you kept hearing, I love you in spite of this stuff. Yeah. And that ain't what they were saying. In fact, no. they were saying the opposite. Yeah. What, what's the thing that, that, that prevents us from hearing authentic love and seeing and recognizing authentic love in the context of your life and maybe even bigger picture? Man, that's a great question. And I'm going to just start by saying I don't know. But... But, but, I, but I appreciate you seeing that in the book, right? I think sometimes you read these kind of books and I think one way we exceptionalize black um, artistry or black folk is by acting like they were just, you know, like even the rose grows in concrete. I hate that shit, right? Mm -hmm. I hate that. Roses don't, I mean, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. But like, you know, my mama, though she was abusive, she was also incredibly loving of me. My grandmother, like, modeled a particular kind of love. And outside of those, like, you know, matrilineal kind of love models, you know, my boy, who never told me he loved me until we graduated high school, he told me, the, 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 the illest thing he ever told me was, like, <laughs> I had to weigh myself before we went to play this basketball tournament in, um, in this place called Vicksburg, which means a lot historically. And I got on the scale and I weighed like 231, 232 pounds. I was like 5'10 at the time, I was 7th, 8th grade. And, and the coach started dying laughing, all my boys started dying laughing. But my boy boy, Lathan, was like, everybody laughing because you 5'10, which is like, you know, 8 inches shorter than Jordan, but you weigh like 30 pounds more than George, right? And he started laughing. And that shit was funny when he said it. But I was feeling some kind of way about that, right? And then he was like, he was like, nigga, you, you. Like, and that was his way of saying, I love you, fam. Like, fuck that number on the scale. Like, you, you. I couldn't hear it that way. I just was like, the you that I was, I just knew was like bigger and like, again, sweatier than the other boys. And I, and I felt some kind of way about that. And then I got, I got, I got love from different people in my community, like a lot of love. So I don't know why I internalized what appeared to be really warm love as like, we love you even though you fucked up because that's not what people said to me. Right. They never said that to me. I mean, some people did say that to me, but the closest people to me were like, we, we, we love you, we gonna love you. And yeah, we gonna call you when you fuck up, but we love you and we know you love us. So I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you smarter than me, maybe you can talk about that. I, I don't know, fam, like, I really don't know. I don't know, um, I do know that, um, I'm not trying to divert that question, but I do know the white supremacy, anti-black, and patriarchy is real. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes like those forces 
kind of sort of dictate our imaginations much more than actual real people do, which is what is the scariest thing to me. Um, so while those real relationships were happening, a lot of other things were happening. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of, you know, a lot of things that I can't talk about in this room and a lot of things I can't talk about in this room were happening. It had to do with like police and things like that. So I think all of that had to play in it. But I do want people to understand, like I was, I mean, I'm here today because I was loved. Um, <coughs> by people who who, 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 who who saw me in spite of what I saw in me often. And and, and, and I'm more than grateful and I'm more than thankful for that. But I think that's really important to say because I'm not the fucking Rose who, who grew in concrete. Like, I'm, I'm whatever the fuck who grew in like rich, complicated Mississippi soil. There's a couple interesting literary moves you make that I, that I thought were, we're telling, and I, I want to know yeah. just a little bit more about them. Okay. Um, maybe I'll ask one of them, because I don't want to ruin the book for you. I mean, I want y'all to appreciate the book on its own. <laughs> um, there are several moments in the book where you talk about when, freedom. Yeah. You, you say, and, I, and then I felt free. Yeah. Um, when did you feel free? <clears throat> um, so, thank you for that. You could hit this. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh, you get something like this after people being like, tell me about addiction. You know, like, uh, do you still talk to your mama? So what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do in that book, uh, at least for my family and, and for my region, is sort of demystify and also mystify this notion of free as a destination. And so in my life, I felt free when I literally, for example, was starving myself to death. Like, I felt free, I felt delivered. I think our American exceptionalism like find, sort of feeds on this progress narrative where like freedom is like something we can attain or all of that shit. So, you know, when I had gotten myself down to 2% body fat, it was fainting. 157 all, I was 150. I mean, that's that's for me. That's a, that's nothing for me. I'm a, I got. I'm literally big boned. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, I was 157 pounds. I was running too much. I was not eating all the time. I wasn't eating much at all. But when I was out there running, I felt free. I felt delivered. You know, I felt fantastic. All of these words that I think are shrouded with a particular kind of terror. Mm -hmm. If we really examine them. Mm -hmm. The first time my mama, my mama, when I graduated college, I really wanted to stay in Mississippi because of the work my mama did and because of what I believe Mississippi's promise was. So I stayed in Mississippi. My mama got a postdoc at Harvard the year I graduated high school. So she left me her car. I didn't have a license, but she left me her car. Uh, first thing I did when I got in the car is I drove to Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know if y'all got Waffle Houses up here. I drove to Waffle House. Y'all got Waffle House? No. Okay. No. <laughs> but you know. We're all very upset about that. <laughs> but, the old, but the old Waffle House used to have all you can eat menu on the left side. Y'all know, some of y'all know that. All you can eat, yeah. All you can eat menu on the left side, three ninety nine. So I dropped my mom off at the airport. I took her old mobile. She was like, take the car to, to Millsaps, leave it there, Millsaps College, till we come back. I drove to, um, Waffle House, I drove to Dunkin' Donuts. I just ate all the shit that I could not eat in front of her because she was always policing my weight. And I felt free then. You know what I'm saying? Like, the first time I remember, like, vividly looking in the eyes of my girlfriend's face, and she was like, I saw you in the car with so and so. And I was like, What? No. <laughs> that wasn't me. How, how you see that? You know, who, who did you see? You know? And she literally believed the lie I'm telling her in her face. I felt free, <laughs> which means to me, deliverance and freedom need to be like actively and radically fucking like interrogated, mm -hmm. especially in a nation that, it, that, 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 that congratulates itself on progress at the expense of other people's peril. So the book beyond all this other personal shit is really about the terror of what I think American conceptions of freedom, American conceptions of progress, and American conceptions of deliverance are. And I think I wanted to write it in a way that could be palatable to people who might not have read lots of books about that kind of stuff. But that's what that shit is about. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's really what it's about. That's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. I, I felt really uh, encouraged. There's all these moments in the text where you talk about people who laughed and laughed and laughed until they didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or cried and cried and cried until they stopped. And you do it every single time except the last time in the book. Right. 
where she cried and cried and cried until she apologized. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that's not a coincidence. No. <laughs> that's good, bro. You read it. <laughs> you be reading. You really be reading. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, and, and also, I just I'm glad you brought that up because to me, the the, the when people tend to write about this book, they don't. I don't think they spend much time thinking and talking about absurdity. I don't think they spend much time thinking and talking about the way I wanted the book to grapple with the comic. You right, know? that's what and, yeah. and the comic, the, the the funny, the bodily funny, sometimes to evade, sometimes to get inside, mm-hmm. to me is in not every page, but at least every chapter of this book. And in some, like the Black Abundance sections, I think that shit is in damn near that's every. That's my favorite. That's my favorite too. That's my favorite too. <laughs> um, uh, so, I just I just wanted to remind people that like yes like again like we laugh and we laugh and we laugh and and then we don't and then we start again and we laugh and we laugh and we laugh and then we don't but like what happens after the don't is a, is, is an interesting thing that I want in the book there's a lot of things that happen in between the laughing and laughing and sometimes we're laughing to evade people looking at us sometimes we're bodily like our bodies can't stop from laughing but at other times we're laughing to let people know you can stop looking at me now that's that's how a lot of that's how a lot of laughter works and also there's that laughter i think with intellectuals that's like <laughs> i get the joke you know like that john stewart type laughter you know what i mean like <laughs> you get it too <laughs> like you know i just think i think laughter is i think laughter is so crucial in this particular I think political context but also where I'm from we stay laughing we stay loud give a fuck what is happening yeah. we stay laughing and 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 I want to sometimes talk about what precedes that laughter and what comes after that laughter do you know what I'm saying and and and, and it's hard to do that but I, I thought if I could write a book I could kind of do that so that, that that's one of the refrains in the book laughing laugh and at the end she didn't she laughed and laughed and laughed and then she apologized but the apology was also just so we could get out, right? Like mm. we're in a hotel room, like we're both looking at that door in a casino, um, a place that we're both addicted to. And we both looking out because we don't want to stay in that room talking to each other, having to deal with that shit. Mm. We want to get out and real talk, we both want to get out so we can go gamble, even though we ain't got no money. But apologizing was one way that my mama could get out the room and apologizing was one way that like I could get out the room and ultimately leave the casino and turn right back back around and come back to the casino yeah you know so that's that this got real heavy because so I'm, 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 going, I'm going i'm going pivot okay okay i'm going pivot um the south the south you put on for the south as much as anybody i've ever met you maybe you in the mind i was about to say, <laughs> I was about to say. Yeah. what is what does it mean to write a text like this where the South is central. And, and, and I'm asking that, particularly for this generation of black writers. Um, right. What does it mean? Um, I'm gonna try to be honest with that question. So, okay. So, I don't think people admit this, but I think a lot of what we value in terms of black, deep South literary production in this country is sort of black versions of Faulkner. Mm-hmm. I think we value a lot of people who I actually value who do Faulkner better than Faulkner. Mm-hmm. Absolutely agree with that. I believe it. I, I love that. But can, can, can you just, for the benefit of people who haven't read Faulkner, say what so, that means? So, so for me that means that one of the things <clears throat> Faulkner did exceptionally well is he talked. He wrote a lot about the way, a, a, a lot about the way natural worlds, like in, uh, somehow anticipated, like like uh, uh, material and and, and 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 humane, like 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 natural impulses, right? So if you read Faulkner, you see a description of a magnolia tree or or an azalea. You can almost know we're about to get something um, internally that like completely is jarring to that. And but to do that shit, you have to be in a place that's full of like el- uh, uh, azaleas and full of like you know Negro maidens and shit like that, <laughs> who are really often in Faulkner's work sort of just natural world artifacts, ornaments, right? Yeah. Like ornaments. And and then and then and and then you know some stuff like Go Down Moses, you 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 see him actually attempt to give particular kinds of subject positions to black characters who happen to be black women sometimes and people pat them on the back for that and I think that that actually is Faulkner's best work whatever 
Faulkner couldn't write like Faulkner if he grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. You know what I'm saying? Like Jackson, Mississippi is an urban black city surrounded by rural black country ass towns. Not fucking super white ass towns where a few black people sprinkled in there. So I get what Faulkner was doing. I get what a lot of Southern black writers are doing when they sort of try to do that shit better than Faulkner. But that's not where I grew up. You know what I'm saying? Like. I grew up in Jackson. I grew up in Jack in like name for Andrew Jackson, right? Like yeah. Highway 55 and Highway 20. All of these motherfucking things intersect. And so for me to tell the stories of my city, I just had to appreciate what Faulkner did, but also be like that that one kind of South that Faulkner wanted to write about is not is not where I'm from. And Eudora, who actually is from my city, also couldn't tell stories that center us because she didn't have like the writerly ability I don't think and this isn't a diss because I love you Dora Welty actually much more than I love Faulkner but she couldn't have she didn't have the writerly ability I think the will to actually conceive of subject positions that were not like fucking like white women or black women who really relied on white women for everything the, the main thing is like these white motherfuckers don't understand that we can't we don't want to fuck with them they don't think they don't understand when they create these white these, these black characters that we really do not want to be fucking with them. Now so we don't. We got to, but we don't. Like, and if and if somebody would have told one or two of them that, everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes in the literature. And so because that that shadow was so heavy and so deep, I think as a young writer, you you you're, you're prone to like want to want to write these correctives. But because of hip hop. And because of fucking lots of other black writers, I'm like, I'm not trying to write a corrective to y'all. Like, I'm not trying to, that's just another way to center them, right? Like, I'm trying to like use the tools that I've been given, or oral tools, literary tools, cultural, spiritual tools, to kind of tell other stories that I maybe haven't seen before. <laughs> and so, that's what I'm trying to do for my for my region. But I think it's, it's I'm also doing it in a, in a time where like a lot of rappers have, have, have sort of tried to do it too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like Crit is doing it, you know? And he comes up in a town called Meridian, which is a which is another like strange like it, people think Meridian is white, but Meridian is a very black fucking town, you know? And it's right next to Forest, which is another like black town. Black people don't have power, but there's a lot of black people in in those places. Um David Banner was like, you know, two or three years older than me, but he was in a group called Crooked Letters with my best friend's big brother and Kamikaze. And so like they, I saw them attempting, I saw them attempting to mimic the shit that was coming out from up here. And then I saw them attempting to actually like use words to craft <coughs> what was happening in our experience. So anyway, I was just trying to do some of that yeah. with our work. Sometimes I go overboard because I think I try to project this kind of like critique of New York and diss in New York <laughs> that's not really grounded like I, you know I was in Brooklyn last night I was in Manhattan the other day like I love like the people I love the most in the world other than Mississippi live in those places and I think sometimes just trying to be oppositional I try to diss I try to diss that shit yeah I might do that too yeah, okay okay good, good, yeah, like okay. we're going to in New York yeah, yeah. no it, matter what right <laughs> that's what it, no matter what and so anyway so I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to create a literature that I haven't seen, but also that's heavily influenced by the literature that I have seen, um, the, the, the literary arts that I have seen, and I think music is literary art too. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the last two years, we've gotten to read Michael Denzel Smith, yes. Darnell Moore, yeah. uh, we had Michael Arsenal here last week, oh, wow. um, uh, so many before that, there was Charles Blow, mm -hmm. slightly different kind of text, but, yeah. but nevertheless, this is a moment of, of memoir right um that seems at its height yeah um there are others but um sorry but those yeah um there's the, there's always the fear that, that the memoir can become its own cottage industry and that it becomes a self-indulgent yeah. thing or becomes a, yeah. another branding tool yeah um, but I feel like something else is happening here. What do you think, Sam? We're going to do another event? Uh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> and I'll answer. Okay. No, no, I'm just messaging you. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think part of it for me, what, what I find interesting, one, is, is, is that a lot of those voices are queer. Right. Which I find to be really compelling and interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it seems to be a generational moment, mm -hmm. a generational shift. Mm -hmm. 
I think there's a sense of urgency. Yeah. Um, that I wish other generations had taken up. Right. To say that we may we, we may not have this moment. Mm. Right. That was Bill Hooks's point. Yeah. And remember Rapture, right? He's like, yeah. yo, I wish we had more black women who, right. who had written memoirs. Right. Mm-hmm. But they we died so young. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. we don't have a Tony Cape and Bar this. We don't right. have you know you know what I mean? Right. We don't have an Octavia Butler that. Although we could or should. Yeah. So because they're dying and we're killing us and there's always this threat of death, maybe it's not self indulgent to write a memoir yeah. or to write five memoirs. Right. So for me, it, it's it's an acknowledgement of that. Right. And some of it is just market logic. We can of talk course, about that right, too. Right, right, right. But, but what do you think is happening? Oh boy. Um, I mean, I think to answer that question, I, I I will just say I think black folk particularly, I think we should push back against this notion of navel gazing being something that we should not do. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I think we see language to people who, who fucking want to terrorize us too much, mm-hmm. be it microaggression, you know, I think that's a seeding of language, or like this idea that like writing memoirs necessarily are navel gazing. Yes, I think there are memoirs out there where it appears that the writer has not thought about much outside of their imagination or their experience. But with all the fucked up shit in the world, I just think it's interesting that we would be like, that's what's fucked up. This person took their life so seriously. <laughs> they look into the contours of their black ass life, their black ass navel, and like went all in that black ass navel and told us what was in there. Can you believe that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Motherfuckers are like killing people left and right and starving us left and right, and we are harming each other in creative ways left and right. So, so I just want to say, start p- p- pushing back against that notion that like that the memoir, even bad memoir necessarily, is something that we don't, that, 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 that like can harm us. I do think that the market has to be taken into consideration though. And I do think that the market sort of might want that kind of memoir more, but my hope is like, you know, in the black communities I'm from, I wish every motherfucker wrote a memoir. I wish everybody had the audacity to be navel gazing. And then let's talk about, again, like what one pulls out of their navel. I think sometimes bad memoirs don't want the echo. Bad memoirs just want the fucking shit to go out there and you just want to walk around and not have it be interrogated. Um, but I, I do think, like, it's very weird. Like, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I don't really know why the market right now is seemingly, like, more interested in black southern stories. But I, but I will say, I think we also were just talking to Imani about this. It's it's not just black southern stories. Like I would even argue, we see a, we see a whole lot more not memoir but stories coming from Nigerian and Nigerian American authors. Mm. But we don't see people asking about like why the fascination with you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's some shit that we may not be able to talk about in this room because there's a lot in that. Um, so all I'm saying to my folks who write, you know, whether it's Menda whomever, like you know, write the fuck out of your memoir in this moment. And if you can use this moment to help take care of yourself and help take care of other people while writing like expansive fucking full of integrity literature, do it. But I don't know why they seem interested. Like part of it I think has to do with like, now I, I, I don't want to put that out there. I, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why. I'm surprised. And that's okay. No, no, but I'm saying, I'm saying that because like I'm not, I did not think, I mean I had to write two books, that, two independent books that did um, well monetarily to be able to do this shit. Mm. Like, I think that's really important to say. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? And mm. I think that I made the decision to do those two books independently because at that time, literally, this was just five years ago, the market was like, we don't want to hear you fuck. I mean, I wrote an essay book on how to slow cure yourself and others in America, like in 2012, right? It's amazing book. You haven't read it, grab that. 2012, there wasn't no essay. You know, I was told those essay books don't sell. Nobody wants to read the fucking essays. I had a deal with Penguin. I wrote this matter fictive book called uh, Long Division. I had a deal with Penguin. They told me to take the racial politics out of the book. They told me to take the book out of Mississippi and put it in New York. They told me to change the narrator from two or three black sort of like uh, shared conscious narrators to one white girl. Like this is what Penguin. This is what Penguin told me to do. And the person who told me to do it was a black editor who was speaking for a white press. I just want to make sure we don't put all the put all the onus on this black woman who was told to do something. But that was just three or four or five years ago. Like, I didn't just become dope today, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I've been okay at this shit for a minute. But the, but the, but the, but the fucking, like... But I think it's post-Black Lives Matter, for sure. 
It's definitely post black. Yeah, that's yeah. part of it, right? Mm. It's mm. part of it. But also, it's like I had to sell 50,000 books out of my fucking trunk. <laughs> right. Literally. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. To be able to do some shit like this. And so, at the end of the day, they ain't going to publish this if they didn't think it was going to sell. And they thought it was going to sell because I sold so many by myself. Mm. That's me. But then you get, you know, I look at somebody like Michael, who also, like, I'm not going to put Michael's business out here too much, but like, Michael broke the game with that book. And people who invested in Michael didn't think Michael was going to break the game with that book. I'm mm-hmm. talking about Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael Denzel. Also, I think people thought that book was going to do okay. I don't think they thought it was going to be a New York Times bestseller. Right. So I'm saying, like, there's a market drivenness to this, but there's also, like, a hunger in our people, mm-hmm. which is, like, much more interesting to me than the market. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, you, so, you, so you, you write this book. You go to your grandma's porch. You read it to her. Yeah. I, then you give it to your mom. Hmm. The toughest part about memoir when you're young is everybody's lying around to read it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Mm-hmm. And you're accountable for this text. Yeah. What happens? <laughs> um. So I I, I I I think I have to say that my mama was. I didn't just create this book and then give it to her. My mama was around for different drafts, different iterations. Um, I didn't feel comfortable putting this book out without talking to her because she's so central to it. Um, but, yeah, the honest truth is, I mean, I mean, she's, she's really, uh, I think she's really scared about what this book will mean for her mm-hmm. as a black woman who still needs to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and my mama has a job where white women work like laterally and beneath her, so she was she was scared of that, and um, I think she's afraid of what putting the stuff out in this book about myself will mean for me, in terms of um, having jobs and shit in the future. You know, I mean, she's she's still a black she's still mom. Worried you know about that, right? <laughs> like like some good. I mean, we had, we got some good news like yesterday, and and it was good monetary news, and <laughs> and my mama was like. Well, Key, you gotta stop dressing so ridiculous. <laughs> that's what, and I got real heated at that shit. I was like, yo, I just told you something that's gonna mean that, like, we gonna be okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, grandma ain't never gonna need for much until she passes. And she was like, just stop looking ridiculous. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think there's some love in there in that sort of utterance, but I think there's a lot of fear. But you know what I'm saying? My mom, I mean, this is what I say everywhere I go. My mama created me, fam. Like, you know, like, I literally am a, like, I, I'm a writerly beast, my nigga. Like, I just like to read and write, like, too much. And so, I wanted to write a daring piece of art. And I wouldn't have wanted to write that daring piece of art had she not insisted that I become a writerly beast. So, I like, in some ways, her investment coming full circle. That don't mean she has to like it all. But, but I wouldn't have been able to do this without her. And so, like... Sometimes when she says things that hurt my feelings, I have to understand that she's also speaking from a place where her feelings are hurt. Because at the end of the day, my mama would rather me not be talking to anybody about her failures. But part of what our, like, part of what, like, a liberatory love literary movement means is, like, I can get in front of people and I can talk not just about how good I am, but I can tell you and tell these motherfuckers, right, like, yo, I failed. That's some shit my mom and grandmama can't do. They can't get in front of anybody and be like, as black women, and be like, I failed. They created a black boy who can do that. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. I guess, I don't know, I just really relate really hard to your mother telling you not to look so ridiculous because yeah. my mother tells me that consistently. But what does that even mean? Like, does she want you in a Steve Harvey suit? Like, what does like, <laughs> not looking ridiculous to her mean? Because you know what that, you know what it means just like I know what it means to my mother what does that mean to her I mean what it means to her is that I just I told Imani there's a writer out there she wants me to look like I'm not gonna say his name in public but it means that like if I'm gonna be up here talking about writing she wants me to look no it's not Steve Harvey (laughs) not Steve Harvey she wants me to he's not a writer (laughs) she wants me to she wants me to look and present in a way that is that is that is like respectable but also just has few if any tentacles right like nothing poking out of the size of it right and so like if i'm gonna write a book that has like the themes at this at its center 
she wants me to write like a sociological book where I don't at all expose myself or the family. I expose the ideas that the family sort of, and I understand that, I really understand that. But I'm, I mean, first of all, people write that shit better than me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying to step in a lane where I can do some actual work, you know, um, that matters. And like, that, you know, so I just think it means she wants me to, when I present in front of people, to wear, to wear the suit, to wear the tie, to not wear pants that seem too big, to speak the king's English, to never cuss, and to never ever say a word about myself or anything in my family that could be deemed as like not, not fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's what it means, and I got it. I understand why she feels that way. But we can't, we can't be always be exactly what our parents want. I mean, you know, right? Yeah, so that's where I'm at, that's where I'm at. Uh, first of all, I just definitely wanna say uh, thank you for uh, just coming here, my man. Uh, Love your book, How to Soul You Kill Yourself and Others While in America. Yeah. Uh, that hit me really hard because I can really relate to it, being from Mississippi as well. Where are you from? Woodville, Mississippi, okay. like yeah, yeah. 40 minutes away from yeah, Nashville. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, it's like I've, I've only been in Philly almost about three years now. Um, do you find yourself like kind of code switching at times, being from a rural area and then coming to a city area at times? Uh, I don't even know if it's code switching anymore, but I guess the answer would be yes. Because if I was talking to my grandmama right now, I wouldn't be talking the way I'm talking, even to you right now. Do you know? I, I just wouldn't be. And it wouldn't even be like I'm finna switch it off. It'd just be like I just wouldn't be talking the same way. Um, <clears throat> but I think the bigger question for me is like when I write. Yeah, and, and the hard part is like when I'm writing it, is I'm writing to my mama, I'm, I don't even know you, but I'm writing to you. You know, I'm writing to Mark, I'm writing to Imani. But the literal editor is a white woman from Massachusetts. <laughs> the literal publisher is a white woman from Brooklyn. Both of my publicists are young white women from Brooklyn. They talking on the phone trying to sell this product to Barnes & Noble or Amazon or like white folks. So like, I, 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 I'm saying all that to say, even when you try to write and connect directly to folk who you know love you, who you need to stay alive in this industry, there's so many hands that ultimately are gonna be like, no, yes, okay. And that shit scares me. I'm not sure what to do with that. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure what to do with that also in my job, in my real job, you know what I'm saying, where I write, where I'm a teacher, where I'm a professor. Um, so I definitely cold switch. But the scary part to me is like when I think I'm doing, like when I think I'm presenting art like to you, the reality is like there are at least 15 different white hands who who, who, san who have to sanction that shit before it gets to you, which is scary. But the dope thing is I believe in them lower frequencies, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I believe in them lower frequencies. Me, me and Paul Beatty, I love Paul Beatty. I think we disagree about that a lot. You know, Paul Beatty b b belief is that like, you know, if you read the sellout that like white folk now, like there is little that is black because they got their hands in all of it. But like the dope thing about us is that like we we do speak on lower frequencies, higher frequencies. I don't think they fucking know what the fuck we be talking about often <laughs> at all. I mean, and I worked with people. I worked with people from Ferguson like a few years ago doing some shit, and like I know they don't know. My motherfuckers were writing shit in Twitter, letting cops and everybody else know what the fuck was going on, but they weren't. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So 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 I'm saying two things at once. I'm saying like I'm, I'm afraid of how many hands are in like my communication to you. They do not. I don't think have like an abiding love for us. But I'm also believing that like we can still talk to one another in meaningful ways because I just don't think sometimes they understand <coughs> what they read it. Yeah. So in the book, there was this like obsession with reading Black Boy, right? Like over and over and over. And then kind of toward the end, there was rejection of writing like Baldwin, yeah. right? So I'm wondering like, why are those the models? Why did, how did you feel like you wrote against them or to them? Yeah. So, and in between that, there was like my memory of reading Tony K. Bambara for the first time. And so, Richard Wright was like coming up, if you were going, if you were a black boy who wanted to write in Jackson, they gave you Black Boy, right? Of course. And, and they wanted you to, if you weren't gonna do the Faulkner thing or the Wealthy thing, like do the Richard Wright thing. And like I tried to do the Richard Wright thing and I appreciate the fight that Richard Wright had. Um, I, I don't think Black Boy's Richard Wright's like best work, but it, 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 was, it did some useful work for me. Baldwin was the first, um, Baldwin was the second writer who I like read the way I listened to music, like play, rewind play rewind like I wanted to reread sentences to see how Baldwin was doing it but 
in the middle of that shit is Tony K, right? And Gorilla My Love. Like, I wanted to do what Tony K Bambara did in Gorilla My Love. Like, that's what I wanted to do. Cause I never, I just didn't know you could do it. I don't know if you read that, but like, I just didn't know you could do it. And so it's not so much, am I trying to reject Baldwin, but I am trying to say in the mid nineties, Baldwin's, I think my understanding of the fire next time Baldwin was an understanding like Baldwin really believed I think the white liberals could change and would change and yeah. and when and when he says at the end you know we must like lovers insist on and create a consciousness in others I understood that and I started trying to write like that but then I was like but what if we are fucked up <laughs> what if the we the collective we needs help too right and so I wanted to push back against that do you know what I mean and I also wanted to push back against like I think rights refusal to really like ultimately love Mississippi. That's controversial, but no. I understand why Wright had to dip. I understand everything, but I just don't think if he had to dip that we had to dip. But then I left Mississippi and I came back. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I just think it's important that between those two, we see, um, and even before that, you know, we see some Nikki Giovanni, we see Margot Walker, and we see Tony Kay. Um, but Baldwin is the person I, that I thought a lot about when I was writing this kind of book because of Fire Next Time and because of his direct address to his nephew. And then like the rest of the book that is obviously to me not written to his nephew or you or me, I don't think so. Thank you for this book. Um, Mark sort of touched on what happens after you write this book and share it with people who are still alive to read it. Yeah. I'm curious about how you committed, I know so many people who are writers and who are afraid to write the truth about people who are still alive. Mm. How did you commit to that process, knowing that the people that you would be writing about are still alive and would read it and would interact with it? So again, I just believe in the drafting process, which means that there are like three things that I wanted to write in this book, three experiences, and that I feel like are the, I'll try not, the word trauma is not in this book, but there are three traumatic experiences that I wanted to kind of be like three fulcrums, even though that doesn't work, like, you know. But none of those three things are in the book because two of those things would have exposed people uh, in my family too much. And one of those things, um, I said this before, but like, um, I was trying at, at near the end of this book to also talk about my investment in a particular kind of emotional abuse with one of my partners. And in this relationship that I had with this with this woman, she, she, she was, she loved me in ways that I did not deserve to be loved, but she also talked to me about like her relationship with abuse and asked me to talk back. And I refused to talk back to her about what actually happened to me or what, I, what I'd actually done um, and she was a very vulnerable person. And in this book, when I first started, really, when I really found out what I was gonna do, I was like, yo, I'm gonna I'm I'm write that wrong. I'm gonna write all the shit that I actually did. <laughs> and I wrote that draft out. And then I, and then I contacted my ex-partner. And my ex-partner was just like, you don't get to do me wrong in private and then get paid Scribner money <laughs> to write that wrong in public. Wow. Keep my name out of your book. So I kept <laughs> her name out of my book. <laughs> but, but, but then it's like, then what do you do? And so, so in the book, there, there are a number of times where I talk about being emotionally abusive and I gesture at it but you have to respect people, especially people you've harmed. And you don't want to, I mean, trigger means too many things nowadays, but you don't want to trigger people who've told you, don't fucking trigger me. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So for me, that was the harder part because the other two things, I talked to people who were involved, <coughs> they were like, don't put that in the book. Cool. But that thing is something I thought I really wanted to put in the book. But I, I mean, I, I, I think I didn't want to put that in the book for the right reasons. Like if, yeah, and I, I said this when Mendel was at this other event, I think part of me wanted to put that in the book in the hopes that like this person would let me back into their life, live, light lives, which is really <coughs> fucked up. Um, and so I just, I'm saying that the long, long one way of saying, I think it's all a process. And if you commit to drafting, you can you can deal with all of that but if you don't commit to draft you just gotta write the fucking book out then you kind of stuck and then you i think sometimes 
put a lot of things in and maybe shouldn't be put in but there are people everybody that i feel like was potentially harmed in this book i talked to along the way and um if they asked me to take things out with the exception of my mom i took it out so thank you for that i heard you touch on baldwin's insistence that white people can change yeah um sounds like hope and we've seen what mm. hope has like been like in a political climate of course mm -hmm. obama all that stuff but even in the slave spirituals we was hoping for another day yeah. you know what i mean uh, my question to you is, like you see joy, like you see freedom as a destination, do you see hope as a destination? And if so, I mean, do you still write from that place? Do you still write from a place of, do you write from a place of hope? I don't, I mean, not that white people can change, but that, I mean, maybe we one day go see the prom promised land or something, or you write I from mean, that place? you know, I, I want to be up here and be like, why, you know, fuck white people, they can't, like, they're human, like, white people can't change. Like, the question to me as an artist is like, do I want to invest my artistry into asking and begging white folks to do something that greater artist mm -hmm. by the name of Baldwin, by the name of Fannie Lou Hamer, mm -hmm. by the name of Morrison couldn't do. Like it's not like do I think of course they can change. White folks have changed and they will change, but but like but like as a writer, I just can't mm -hmm. write no book that is just about hoping white folk change. <laughs> not from hope. Do I have hope? Yeah. I, I, I well, yeah, this one trying not, to say not that white people can change, but maybe that we can get to that point i have freedom. hope that like I, I definitely have hope fam like i have okay. hope that you know if i'm holding on to mark and mark is holding on to you and you holding on to menda and we really talking about what we holding on to as much as as much as we can without harming one another i think we can we can fight back with like what baldwin called equal force or greater force i think our liberation movements have much more integrity and hope if we are, if we are tied mm -hmm. together, if we are tied pushing back, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a massive amount of hope in that. But I don't know how to do that shit and appeal to like white people's moral fucking like desire to be better. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. But it, it, it it's just tough because that's what. You, but like, I I don't know, fam. Like I just always tell myself, you know, Fannie Hamer to me was was the most was the greatest example of what I call informed, sincere fight. Mm -hmm. And motherfuckers did not listen. Yes. Right. So I'm not gonna play myself. Right. <laughs> when there's other things to do. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I don't think white people can't, can't change. Like, shit, <coughs> like, yeah, they can, but like as an artist, like where are you putting all your, where are you gonna put all your shit at? Mm -hmm. And monetarily, I do know. I mean, the Wall Street Journal wants me to write that piece. New York Times wants me to write that piece. Time Magazine wants me to write that piece. All these motherfuckers want me to write that piece. I don't come from no money. So sometimes you want to, you have to do that piece. <laughs> you know? But if it, if it takes up, I'm not going to write no book about that shit, you know? I just have, I mean, Vanity Fair, I'm just going to say, you, this is too much. Vanity Fair just asked me to write this piece about, um, about Michelle Obama. And, 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 and this is, this is different. This might open up too much, but, and, and I have, I have, I have a few opinions about Michelle Obama, but you know, like, like. I think they kind of wanted to do that battle royale stuff. Like they know where I stand. They wanted me to get up in there and take Michelle Obama on. And so I, I kind of sort of did. But but I also at the end of that, I'm like, we want to believe that Michelle Obama loves us as much as we love her. When I say that, I think people know what I'm saying. That's right. But I'm also saying, Michelle Obama, you got to tighten up a little bit. Right. I love you to death. You got to tighten up a little bit. You know. So I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that like, I, I just, my, my artistic practice can't be consumed with that. But at the same time, I got folks around me who really need <coughs> air, cars, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like that bargain. I was talking to Money about this months ago, like how, how do we do that bargain? I, I don't know how to do it completely like right, but I know we have to, a lot of us have to do it because we're not, we're not wealthy. Maybe a few more, do you know what's Oh, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I really appreciated the way you treated your mother in this autobiography, and I thought it was like really gentle. I was wondering if um, hearing you speak about like people that you you've read and you you use as models is like your engagement with black women writers has yeah. like maybe allowed you or, or presented a way for you to do that kind of like work um, writing about your mom. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, th I mean, th there are a lot of older books that were really fun foundational for that. I think Color Purple was foundational to not just like the relationship between 
mothers and stuff, but 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 black black abused, harmed bodies writing to one another. Like that was a crit but also this book that people don't talk about enough called Mothers by Britt Bennett. I don't know if you read that book. Yes. Yeah. It's it's like that's a really it's 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 a good book. It's a really, 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 really um I think it's a good book. I think she's doing something that, that we haven't seen that I haven't seen a lot like of. San Diego? Hmm? Like, you know, because about black women in San Diego. In San Diego, right. right. Nobody right. Nobody's right, right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um and also there's a there's a writer uh, who really influenced me a lot and she was writing about her father primarily but her mother is like a secondary character to their relationship but like her mother like also is so hefty in that and this is a woman named Zand Zandria Robinson um, she, she's, she's incredible she writes for Oxford American she writes for a lot of stuff so like those are like three people that they really helped me um, try to render my mother in, in, in non sentimental ways but also <laughs> ways that like had some heft mm. yeah for sure so we have time for th the final two questions i think amani and then the brother in the back yeah i you know i said this too many t i just i think this is just a masterful work um and uh i'm in awe of the courage i mean are you talking about you know how you depict relationships but also what you reveal of yourself right. Um, but the, the question I have is really, and the thing that blows me away is that, you know, this is this form where you share, like the memoir is a form where you tell the story of your life and it's an arc and usually comes to a resolution. You resist resolution yeah. the same way that you resist, right? And that, and that actually to me is so profound. I mean, in terms of addiction and disordered eating and all these sorts of things, is all the things that we think that fix it, we, you know, and we all know, but we don't say it, don't really fix it, right? Um, and dealing with that, but the, f the form, like I kept thinking about the part in Beloved at the end where she keeps saying it's not a story to pass on. You know, like, okay, but it's the story is here, just saying it's not a story to pass on, and that there's something formally happening there that's very similar to what's happening here, where you layer moments, so you have this political read, and then you have the personal story, and then there's the open opacity at yeah. various points and I actually just am curious about how you access that like do you as a as a writer do you begin what is the like and maybe this is a you know maybe it doesn't happen in a clear way but like do you begin with the point that you want to make or do the stories bring you to the revelation do the yeah. memories bring you to the revelation do you start with the yeah, that's a great question. so what I did with this project is uh, I wrote the in, once I once I figured out what the project was gonna be I just wrote the entire project in um, first person present tense like the entire project then I rewrote it all in past tense oh. right and then I rewrote it again in like a future present tense mm -hmm. and then I, I used the sentences that I thought like worked well together um, and, and sort of tried to make like a I mean it's a braided it's, it's braided in a lot of different ways but it's also braided in terms of tense so at the end yeah. um you know with the will um i will i will i will like that sort of future tense narrative is important to me as a kid because when i got in trouble in school i would get whooped and then i would have to write what i would yeah. do mm -hmm. so i wanted i wanted i wanted the book to also read not just like as, as a book that's playing with futurity but also playing with like how we discipline all of our children but particularly black children yeah. but anyway to do that i had to start by writing it in in present writing it in um future and then writing it in past and then picking out the sentences that work the best for different characters to get a particular kind of texture yeah in the name i mean and, and hopefully people who read it don't see all of that no hopefully, hopefully they experience something you know what i'm saying hopefully they experience something else but if you look at every chapter, you know there, there's there's at least three different tenses working in every chapter. The first the first sentence is, you know, I did not want to write to you, like, but that's an interesting sentence, right? Am I is that is it is that I did not want to write to you? Is that present? Is that past? Yeah. Is that future? Like, you know, right. I mean, this is too much probably like writer shit. Nobody gives a fuck about. No, it. we all. Think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> but, but like, I'm just obsessed with like the way you can you can actually there are some there are sentences in in, in our lexicon that actually like embody every single tense. Yeah. And I did not want to write to you as one of them. Do you know? And if, if it, and the last sentence in the book is, um, um, uh, I say, please, mama, don't be mad at me. 
um, I just wanted to put you put you where I've been, which is something my grandma had been saying throughout, but she'd been saying with the B E E N, right? And then I say, I just wanted to I just want to put us where we've been, but I think that also yeah. operates <laughs> backwards and forwards. So that's what I think. You see why niggas don't want to write after they talk to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> we got time for this last question. Yes, sir. I was extremely captivated by your interaction with Margaret Walker. Uh -huh. And um, you had indicated that in the, the last words of the, of the last stanza for my people, let, let, let a race of men now rise and, and take control. You yeah. indicated at the time that you were confused and yeah. mesmerized by that. Yeah. Are you, in 2018, do you still have that same sentiment? Am I still am I still confused by it? Are you still mesmerized and confused? And and if not, what does what does that mean in 2018? So my my, my my mother my mother was working on a project with Margaret Walker uh, before she passed, and Margaret Walker was working on this autobiography of this guy named Aaron Henry, which who was who was the head of NAACP in in Mississippi, but he was also people don't talk about this. He was also one of the first out black people in Mississippi to lead a political movement. And Margaret Walker was working on a, she was working on a biography of him. And so I think it's okay to say, this isn't a diss, I think Margaret Walker was really obsessed with like black male leadership or black boy leadership. And when I'm, and I remember, I remember reading that sentence where she was like, let, let a race of men. Um, I just didn't understand what, what, if we let a race of men like take over, I didn't understand what that, like where would my mama be? You know, like where would Margaret Walker be? Where would my grandmama be? And so am I still confused by it? I think I understand why Margaret Walker said it. Uh, so confusion is not the right word, but um, yeah, you, you know, you don't ever want to correct Margaret Walker, but I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's all I'll say. I, 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 just, I, just, I just think maybe in 2018, I actually think if Margaret Walker had to revise that, maybe she would, maybe she would say something differently. I think that's a fair way to say it. Do you know? Because I'm not going to try to correct Margaret Walker, um, but I think we need more than a race of men <laughs> to lead and fight our liberation. And as we see, the folks leading and fighting this shit are kind of not a race of men usually. You know, yeah. black women, black women got it, got yeah. us, and thankfully, they let us come with them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say, man. I love you so much, man. And, and, and this book is is, is special, and I think everyone who reads it will be better for having read it. Um, so I want to thank you for coming thank and sharing you. some time with us and, and sharing so much with us.